Welcome uh, to the final event of our season and to the longest introduction I've ever written. <coughs> it's really not. It's just really in Miro Rukeyser's 1939 poem titled Reading Time, One Minute, 26 Seconds, she opens with the line, the fear of poetry is the fear. It's a poem which from the very title, you can tell, is quite conscious of the emerging technology of radio and what can elapse in the confines and constraints of recorded time, especially if it's broadcast over space, allowing for what she calls the prolonged wound consciousness. Rukeyser's first recording of that poem was made by the Woodbury Poetry Room and a Harvard professor of rhetoric, Frederick C. Packard Jr., who also made one of the earliest extant recordings of Robert Frost and through his work teaching poetry to undergrads to help them make compelling speeches and broadcasts to fight the rise of totalitarianism. Yes, this is a sentence. Um, and yes, we could use him now. Uh, Packard also made the earliest extant recording of a speech by the very person Frost would one day share the inaugural podium with John F. Kennedy Jr. You can listen to that speech in this very building. I bring Rukeyser's poem up because the works of our guests tonight involve us from the outset in confronting and respecting fear, their own trepidation and uncertainty at undertaking their projects, and the cultural unease and mystery that has come to adhere to both of the subjects they've chosen to explore. Matthew Zapruder's Why Poetry and Alexandra Zapruder's 26 Seconds, and I'll, I'll just abridge the title if you'll forgive me, um, may not share the exact subject matter, though photography as we know through Walt Whitman's documentary Civil War Poetics and film as we see with the imagist poets among others are genres that have long been in generative dialogue, but both books share several fundamental commitments and ethics. To begin with, both texts communicate a profound respect for the amateur, which literally means what is done out of love. Whether it be a grandfather making an amateur film of his beloved president, or the American culture itself at that moment as an amateur en masse in the wake of that tragedy, the inexperienced hands of the Dallas detectives, FBI agents, print and TV media reps, and citizen journalists confronting the enigma and ethical burden that have accompanied that film, or the first time reader of poetry, or second time, or third time, the amateur tackling the implications and dimensions of the fall of Icarus as described by Auden, or the leaves of grass, and through these lyrical poems gleaning the very provisional nature and tenuous rubrics of human communication itself. The Subruder's books painstakingly document and in many ways model the sometimes jubilant, sometimes poignant entrance into knowledge, be it by an individual, a family, a culture, an entire nation, be it in the past or in the present through their very pages. And both texts provide their readers, aka us, a chance to appreciate the kinds of cumulative consciousness and literacy, verbal, cinematic, empathic, and otherwise, that we already possess in order to live in our complex world. And how this consciousness is not only able to lead us to the verge of understanding, but to help us exist in the presence of what can never wholly be understood. That is, I might add, the crucial humility and courage of the humanities. As Matthew writes in Why Poetry, the experience of getting close to the unsayable and feeling it and how we are brought to that place beyond words by words themselves is the subject of this book. Or as Alexandra writes when providing substantive, con substantive context, a harder phrase than you would think to say, for the reception of the initial stills of the Zapruder film, quote, a modern technological invention that allows us to document events, preserve memory, and share experiences can perhaps provide information, but it cannot always give us what we really seek, knowledge, and more important, understanding. A child asks, what is the grass? A culture asks, what happened on the grassy knoll? In the hands of these two authors, those questions are not as far apart as they seem. 
As Matthew writes, quote, in Whitman's poem, Grass is Grass, here's an actual child holding real grass, asking a particular question to a particular person. Grass is the familiar green stuff we see everywhere. And the magic of the poem is how looking at it this way, the grass becomes not less, but more poetic, resonant with meaning. Grass starts to become for the poet and for us, once again, as mysterious it is for a child. The poet's honest answer is that he does not know, but that he is going to start thinking about it in a speculative way. Similarly, Alexandra, the youngest child of Abraham Zapruder, assigns herself the, of the adult task of asking about his film and emboldens herself and us in turn to undertake the honest act of looking at the artifact for what it is and remains, a home movie and a particular man who was its maker and who in turn had to make several crucial decisions about the fate of the painful, pain-filled film and its reception and its artistic ownership, decisions which were themselves subsequently interpreted and acted upon by strangers, folded into a larger framework of prolonged narrative and wound consciousness. By patiently and incrementally observing these entities for what they are, the Zapruders return us with renewed immediacy and pertinence to such elemental questions is, as what are images, what are words, and how do they at once act as vehicles of information and of the imagination, act at once as personal histories and public documents, offer us at once tangible instruments for utilitarian communication and for metaphysical speculation. What is a home movie made by the head of a household when it happens to capture the assassination of the leader of the nation and himself the head of a household? What is a poem if it happens to ask us to question the very nature of our relationship to language and to what we thought were givens, unsettling or awaking us to the very primary instruments, words, laws that bind and benefit and baffle and sometimes bruise the very humans that use them? Through these two consummate works, the Zapruders have succeeded in returning to their and our grasp artifacts and art forms that have been, through certain social and historical forces, distanced and occluded, and in the case of the Zapruder film, one might even say torn from their origins and intimate beginnings. In doing so, the authors have not diminished their uh, mystery, but magnified the total arc of their respective journeys. It seems in keeping with the ethos and mode of these books that tonight we will not simply hear readings by the authors, but will also get to participate in a conversation around these texts, in a conversation led by a writer who is himself dedicated to these questions, Michael Downing. So please welcome Matthew Zapruder, then Alexander Pruder, and then all three of them who will have a conversation after. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, it's great to be here um, for a lot of reasons. First and foremost, to be with my sister. Uh, we don't live in the same city, so any excuse to be together. Um, and um, I'm also glad to see that finally someone um, has paid attention to the clause in my rider that requests that there be a poster of Barbarella behind me each time I read. I say, it's good to see that that's... Um, <clears throat> So uh, I have to admit that um, when Christina asked me to come and give a talk with Alex, my feelings were mixed. I had mixed feelings, or as I like to call them, feelings. Um, but, uh, um, and I thought, uh, um, you know, like I said, just the opportunity to be with Alex would be great and to talk about, you know, poetry with all of you. Thank you for coming through this rainy night. Um, but you know, I don't really like to talk very much about the Zapruder film. I don't, mostly because I don't really know anything about it. Um, and one of the great reliefs of my sister writing this book about the film, which is a wonderful book, was that I no longer have to answer any questions about it because I can just say, just read the book. <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, I don't mind 
discussing it. I just don't really have that much to contribute, I don't feel like. So, um, uh, and I also thought that at my just first reaction was that the pairing was arbitrary, um, other than us being related. But then the more I thought about it, and I think Christina brought that out in her lovely introduction, that there are uh, many things that are similar about our investigations of, of these that take place in these two books that were written more or less contemporaneously. Um, and yeah, maybe we'll talk about those things in the Q&A or they'll come out. Um, but yes, this investigation of what can be known, um, which may be the subject of all writing, I guess, in one way or the other, but um, particularly this epistemological investigation of what, what do we think we know about a subject, what can be known, what are the limits of knowledge, all those things were, seemed to me to be um, interlinked. And so I thought I would read, choose a few passages that just touch on those issues a bit. Um, of course, in my book, which was originally written to address basic questions people have about reading poetry and, and thinking, feeling that they don't understand it, um, a lot of the discussion in my book is, of course, around poems, but also around language itself, what its possibilities and limits are. Um, so, um, yeah. One other reason why, I'm, why I was drawn to do this reading is that um, our father was, is a uh, graduate of Harvard Law School. Um, and so to come back and be here with my sister in the place where my dad, and very close to where my dad was a student many, many, many years ago, was also um, irresistible. So thank you again for coming. I'm actually going to start with a little short passage. So I'll read uh, three short passages, and I'll break them up with, with some poems. Um, the first passage I'm going to read is about my dad. So, The first, and I think only poetry reading I ever went to with my father was at a bookshop next to Washington Square Park in Manhattan. It was afternoon, and there were two poets reading. I remember at lunch we had eaten and drunk to our satisfaction and beyond. So as soon as the first poet began, my father almost immediately fell asleep in his chair, <laughs> leaning back his head, quietly snoring. I didn't wake him. The second poet began. His voice was much quieter than the first, and the whole room seemed to focus down into it. My father's eyes opened. His head snapped a bit alarmingly forward, and he stared at the poet the entire time while he read. Afterward, my father came up to me among the shelves and said, I loved that, even though I didn't understand it. He repeated that sentence over and over, confused and distressed. I didn't know what to say. A part of me wishes I had found a way just to ask him what the poems made him think of, what they brought up in his mind. I would have loved to have heard it. It would have been such a different way of getting to know my father, impossible now. In the end, though, I know it was good for this experience to remain private. It could never have been truly translated or explained. To emerge from sleep, to hear the poems, and follow and join them with a gradually waking mind. To understand them and even love them in a way that comes from language, but is beyond the ability of language to describe. This may very well have been a nearly perfect experience to have with poetry, especially for someone inclined to be skeptical of it. Despite its ordinary resistance to poetry, my father's sleepy, drifting attention slipped easily into the associating movement of the mind of that second reader, the great Slovenian poet Tomasz Szalaman, and then continued in its own private directions. This poem is called Poem for Doom. Sorry. We'll get more cheerful as we go on. <laughs> po poem for doom. Birds don't lie. They're never lost. They never think, above the earth, I stole this form. Or, blue is the best. I listen to it, singing, my old man is far away. Singing American songs, stolen from those who lived in what now is, but was not the park which makes me love him. I'm eating an orange someone grabbed from nature. Over me, I hear controlled, mechanical obsidian dragonflies search for anarchists. For a long time, I went to school in the palm of my life, carrying a stone, 
obeying the law of semblance. Now each night I bring it back, down to the land asphodels cover. Then I wake and take my son out on the porch to say hello everything, hello green hills that slept, hello tree drawn on the side of a white truck, exorably rumbling towards some hole, hello magnolia whose pink and white blossoms have left it for where, oh sweet doom, we're all going. Then behind us, we close the black door with the golden knob and sit in the great chair, morning light through the shades, always makes look like a dream forest throne. All around our subjects, the shadow trees rise up, their private thoughts filling the room. I take them like an animal with gentle, ungrateful ceremony from a leaf takes dew. Um, children have an intuitive sense of the symbolic nature of objects. This is why poems that get close to the consciousness of a child can feel so much more than merely nostalgic. They can bring back truths we have forgotten. When I look back at one of the first poems I loved, Sestina by Elizabeth Bishop, I see that a great part of its effect on me had to do with how it creates symbolic meaning by returning to the mind of a child. A Sestina is a type of formal poem in which six specific end words, in this case, house, grandmother, child, almanac, stove, tears, repeat in a specific pattern. Here are the first several stanzas. September rain falls on the house. In the failing light, the old grandmother sits in the kitchen with the child beside the little marble stove, reading the jokes from the almanac, laughing and talking to hide her tears. She thinks that her equinoctial tears and the rain that beats on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac, but only known to a grandmother. The iron kettle sings on the stove. She cuts some bread and says to the child, it's time for tea now but the child is watching the tea kettle's small, hard tears dance like mad on the hot black stove, the way the rain must dance on the house. Tidying up, the old grandmother hangs up the clever almanac on its string. Bird-like, the almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother and her teacup full of dark brown tears. She shivers and says she thinks the house feels chilly and puts more wood in the stove. This poem has always reminded me of my own childhood. I grew up in an old house in the suburbs of Maryland. Before my family bought it, the house was owned by two unmarried sisters who lived there together until their old age. When we moved in, the furnace and stove were strikingly old. And even after more than 40 years, I can still see them in my mind's eye. Gradually, these things were replaced, but I always felt the presence of this older, shadow version of the house, living somehow in the new forms. Later, when I learned more about the poem, I discovered it recalls Bishop's lonely childhood in Nova Scotia, the old house where she lived with her grandmother. For a long time, I didn't know this as a specific, autobi specific biographical fact, but I could have intuited the outlines of it, if not the details. Most of all, though, out of all the poems about childhood, what brought me close initially to this particular poem and why I returned to it has to do with the way these six simple repeating words gradually take on meaning and resonance as the poem goes on. Through its repetition of these six words, the poem taps into the elemental loneliness and boredom, but also the feeling of unsaid significance of being a child. The poem ends with the possibility of a creative life. It was to be, says the marble stove. I know what I know, says the almanac. With crayons, the child draws a rigid house and a winding pathway. Then the child puts in a man with buttons like tears and shows it proudly to the grandmother. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, the little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac into the flower bed the child has carefully placed in front of the house. 
Time to plant tears, says the almanac. The grandmother sings to the marvelous stove, and the child draws another inscrutable house. As the same six words repeat in different combinations at the ends of lines, the poem takes on a momentum and logic of its own. The child perceives the almanac saying it's time to plant tears instead of seeds, thus conjuring a cycle of sadness and mourning inextricable with the most fundamental realities of our presence on earth. She's aware of the grandmother in her happy loneliness, singing not to another person but to a stove, and she stands outside herself. I is another, as Rambeau wrote in a letter, seeing herself drawing another inscrutable house, attempting perhaps to comfort herself, or at least trying to make sense over and over through drawing and redrawing of what it means to be at home. This poem is called, I Met My Wife. I met my wife in a bar you could throw a frisbee from and hit Emily Dickinson's grave, which would be uncool and not. <laughs> Until that night, my whole life had been a conference where voices amiably disagreed until paralysis ensued. When I looked in her face, something actually for the first time spoke, saying, home is where you've never lived, not yet. What else? Before she said it, I knew her Old Testament name. Home, as everyone knows, is hard. In each room, the most terrible moments keep lasting. Obscure green velvet, continual past light from under every doorway pours into the hallway. You're drawn to enter in fear. It's horrible and good to go through each door into every room, to keep standing in that green light, to spread your arms and take it into your fur. No fantasy is ever better. Still alive, you open your eyes and go back down the stairs to find the other in the kitchen stirring something. Someone says, have a cookie, it won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, one more, one more short section, again about my dad, and then one more poem, and then I will turn it over to my younger sister. <laughs> when I was a child, my father worked a lot. When I woke up in the morning, he was already gone, and he would come home late at night, and also work many weekends. He was always at the office. This word office, such a fixture of my childhood, is probably one reason why I have always been drawn to a poem by Robert Hayden, Those Winter Sundays. Even though Hayden's father was very much unlike mine, a manual laborer, and even though the young Hayden's childhood and mine could not have been more radically different, he grew up poor and African American in Detroit. The poem draws me close. The poem begins by describing the father getting up and going to work even on Sundays. The young speaker sleeps later and only when the rooms were warm is he woken by his father to whom he speaks ungratefully. And here's the poem. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue back cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Those items in the poem are what they are, but also seem to resonate with greater meaning. They are symbolic of the way this father demonstrates his love and care, but in a way that cannot be adequately paraphrased. The poem takes those ordinary items and reanimates them with significance. The indifference in the mind of the child is counteracted retrospectively with a sense that the shoes can, like the items in a Catholic mass, become more than what they otherwise are. This symbolic infusion of meaning culminates with the word offices. When I was a child, I often heard that word, though more often in the singular. The very idea of the office and the word itself therefore became both an actual place and symbolic. That word contained many unspoken, palpable realities, 
It was where my father went and also what he did. I didn't know or understand exactly what it meant, but I knew it was significant. For me, the feeling in the poem is similar to the indifference and taciturn hostility with which, to my great shame and eternal regret, I used to treat my father, who, when I got old enough to drive, would let me use his old car to go to school as long as I would drop him off at the subway. The poem ends with a particular question that, of course, is also a much greater one as well. What did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Through this ending, with the emotional logic of its repetition, that unexpected final word offices becomes endlessly reactivated for me. Nowadays, offices is mostly used to refer to the space where work is done, but it used to mean responsibilities, particularly ecclesiastical ones. Through Hayden's poem, the word has a dignity to it, a respect that comes from the mind of the child who thinks of the ordinary as a holy thing. And the very unexpectedness of this word in the poem in great part is the significance of the poem itself. The way the reader comes upon the holy specialness of the word offices is so much like the way the child came upon that feeling too, suddenly understanding a dignity within the mundane. I'll read one more. Um, this is called When I Was 15. When I was 15, I suddenly knew I would never understand geometry. Who was my teacher? That name is gone. I only remember the gray feeling in a classroom filled with vast theoretical distances. I can still see odd shapes drawn on the board and those inscrutable formulas. Everyone was busily into their notebooks scribbling. I looked down at the Velcro straps of my entirely white shoes and knew inside me things had long ago gone terribly wrong <laughs> and would continue to be. When the field hockey star broke her knee, I wrote a story for the school paper, then brought her the history notes in the snow. She stood in the threshold, a whole firelit life of mysterious familial warmth glowing behind her, and took them from my hands, like the blameless queen of elegant violence she was. Walking home, encased in immense amounts of down, I listened to the analog ghost in the machine pour from the cassette I had drawn flowers on. Into my ears it sang, everything they told you makes you believe you're trapped in a snow globe, forgotten in a dark closet, where exhausted shadows argue what is sorrow cannot become joy. But I am here from the future to tell you you are not. All you must do is stay asleep a few more years. Great traveler waiting to go. Okay, Alex. Thanks a lot, man. That's great. Nothing like having to follow your big brother. Um, thank you all for being here. This is such a treat. When Christina contacted us to ask us if we wanted to do this event, I was not ambivalent. I was thrilled, because I'm the nice one. Um, because I am amazed and inspired by both of my brothers, and I, I also, <laughs> couldn't quite see how this was going to fit together, but as Matthew was speaking about how he felt about the Zapruder film and being relieved that I had written a book about it so that he could refer people to it, I was reminded that there have been many, many, many times in the last years when people have come up to me and said, um, I don't understand your brother's poetry. <laughs> so now he's written a book about it and I can refer them to it. <laughs> so it all works perfectly. Um, I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the project to write this book, which was a very counterintuitive decision for me to have made, and, um, and try to talk a little bit about um, the idea of objects and the meaning of objects, because the Zapruder film means so many things to so many different people, and its meanings have changed over the decades. 
Um, like Matthew, I grew up most of my life not really wanting to talk about the Zapruder film. And like Matthew, I didn't know very much about the Zapruder film. We grew up in a family um, in which our identity was not tied, in, internally at least, um, in any explicit way to the film. We just didn't talk about it. We were Washingtonians, we were Jews, we were Americans, we were the grandchildren of immigrants, we were a lot of things, but we were not um, we were not encouraged to think about the Zapruder film as a defining element of our identity. And because our grandfather died when we were very little, I was 11 months old and Matthew was three, we didn't know him. So the stories that were passed on to us over the years were about who he was to our family. You know, those funny stories about the things that he would do and his sayings and all the kinds of things that made him the person that our parents loved so much. And the film was, you know, I think it's important to say that it was always there. It wasn't like I didn't know about it or it was, you know, it sometimes, or it was taboo or we couldn't talk about, it was just off to the side. It was there, but it was peripheral to our lives. And I recall very vividly many times in my childhood people asking my parents, you know, are you related to the guy who took the thing, you know? Um, and our parents would always, you know, kind of try to shrug it off and try to get out of the conversation as quickly as possible and move on. And it, the message was telegraphed to us from a very early age that this was not something to call attention to, this was not something to brag about, this was something that was a sober responsibility and that we had to uh, be discreet about it. I didn't think very much about the film, um, even through the 1990s when our families um, for lack of a better term, conflict with the federal government was making front page news for, for years on end. Even during that time, I was preoccupied with my own work and it was something that I was aware of, but I very rarely spoke about it with my father. And then in 2004, a year after I was married, or a little less, um, our dad got brain cancer. And shortly after he was diagnosed, he said to me, someone should interview me about the film. And it was the only time I ever remember him nodding in any way to the idea that there was a story to be told, that there was something that he could tell me about this film that I couldn't find out from anywhere else. And I'm not, you know, this reminds me of some of the things that Matthew read, some of the parts of Matthew's poems. I, I didn't interview him. I didn't interview him because he had brain cancer and he was losing his language and it was difficult for him to communicate. And I mostly didn't interview him because I didn't want to know that he was dying. And he didn't want to have me know that he was dying. So he died and took an enormous amount of information and, and insight with him. And in the years that followed, I recall thinking to myself, you know, someone's gonna have to take some responsibility for the material records of this film and our family. Our legal records, people who were close to our family who could be interviewed about the film, our personal papers. At the very least, this material is gonna need to be gathered and put in some kind of order so that for, for the historical record. And I decided that I was going to do that. But I had a problem. Before I could begin to put any kind of order to this material, I had to face the fact that I didn't know anything about the history of the Zapruder film. You know, I was in no position, I didn't even know who to interview. I didn't have, I didn't know anything. So I decided to start reading about it. And there were already at that time several published books on the subject of the film. And what happened was not what I expected. What happened as I began reading was that I realized that there were these gaps in the historical record there were assumptions about things that our family had done. There were misapprehensions about who we were. And above all, there was a way in which the home movie quality of the film, the intimate, personal nature of the film for my grandfather, had kind of floated away from the story. And I started to think, you know, I, and I've said this before and I wrote it in my book, I didn't know anything about the Zapruder film, but I knew a lot about the Zapruders. And it seemed to me that without fusing those two things, the private story of our family, the way that our grandfather's 
life and childhood in particular shaped the decisions he made regarding the film and then how those decisions shaped its time at Life magazine and then what happened when the film came back to our family in 1975 and our father was the guardian for 25 years. That without understanding those ins and outs, it would be very difficult to understand what had happened to the film and how the film had become um, the icon that it now is. You know, one of the strange things about this work is that I knew pretty early on that I, I couldn't have done it if my father had lived. And that was a difficult thing to come to terms with because he was the keeper of the story. And I needed to figure it out for myself. I needed to begin at the beginning I wasn't taking on this work because I already knew something that I wanted to share. I was taking on this work because I didn't know something that I needed to try to understand. And so the work was on the one hand to interview people who were close to our family and people who were not close to our family, read through all of our records, and also gain an understanding of the film's public life. And one of the ways in which I like to think about the film is that it's very much like a pebble in a pond, which is a giant cliche, but whatever, it's what I have. It's like a pebble in a pond. You know, we are living with the reverberations of so many things that first, for whom the point of origin, or for which the point of origin is the Zapruder film. Questions around media ethics, copyright law, the cultural understanding of the limits of photography and technology, moral and ethical questions about profiting from tragedy, you know, the, of course, the long legacy of the assassination itself and the conspiracy theories that came from it, and on and on and on. And so for me, part of the work was to see not only how those, how that moment and how that film shaped all of these aspects of American life, but to put the film back at the center of that point of origin, which I believe that it is. Um, there are many, many, many things to say about the film, but I think for the purposes of this evening, the most important thing to say is that this film, through all the decades that have passed and all of the fights over it. I like to think about the fact that the film never changes. You know, the film is the film is the film. It's the exact same film that it was on November 22nd, 1963, when my grandfather took it. But everything else has changed, and everything keeps changing. And we keep seeing this film through that changing lens. And when we talk about the meaning of objects, which is, in a, in a large way, what the theme is, what is so interesting about the film is that it means something completely different to each constituent group. There were so many different groups of people who had a stake in the film, who could make a real claim on it. So for example, for the assassination researchers who have studied the film at length to try to understand what happened to the president in Dealey Plaza, it is evidence. It is proof. For some, it is evidence that there was no conspiracy. And for others, it is evidence that there was a conspiracy. So right away, we have a problem. Because here is this object that should, in theory, answer our questions. And all it does is further confuse the issue. A any number of people can regard this film, look at it, and see something different. To the media, it was a commodity. It represented an enormous potential to reach viewers and ultimately to profit, to share this, the great scoop of the century with the reading or viewing public. And there were endless fights over that between Life Magazine and CBS News and later networks. To the writers and artists and filmmakers who made reference to the film in their work, it was a symbol or a touchstone, a cultural touchstone. It, it represented the limits of visual truth. How can you have 
a piece of evidence that shows exactly what happened on Dealey Plaza to the president and does not answer the question of what happened to the president on Dealey Plaza. That's a, that's a fundamental question about the very limits of visual truth or the limits of our faith in technology. How, you know, how can it be that this medium that we lean so heavily upon to give us answers to questions could fail so spectacularly when it mattered so much? For the federal government, it became ultimately an object that needed to be owned that it was, it had become by the 1990s a secular relic, in the words of Art Simon, who was a wonderful writer on this subject. It was, it had no, the original film had no practical value anymore whatsoever. It could not be run through a projector. It is in cold storage, packed away. It will never be seen again, but it had to be owned by the American people to the, co to the tune ultimately of $16 million. To the public, it was a memory. It was a collective memory of a traumatic moment in American life. And that is, I think, in many ways, its most um, important legacy, that we all, whether we were there or not, whether we were alive or not, what our grandfather saw through his camera has become what we all see when we talk about the Kennedy assassination. It was a fetish, it was an obsession, it has become a common reference in popular culture, um, the many, 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 many other things to various people. But to us, what I learned in the course of writing this book, and I would have said probably five years ago, to us it wasn't anything, but that's not true. What is true is that to us, it was our grandfather's home movie. He felt deeply responsible for having taken this film. He was deeply concerned about Mrs. Kennedy and about the Kennedy family. And so it became a responsibility and a burden to try to figure out how to make this completely unprecedented object, this, these visual images that the likes of which nothing had ever been seen before in the media, how to make that available to the public, on what terms, at what cost, under what circumstances, how, when, why. And ultimately, it also was a source of financial gain, which brought with it um, a moral price that we as a family had to reckon with. So with that, all of that in mind, this idea of this single object that has all of these meanings for different people, many of which I should say are, are intrinsically at odds with one another. The, for example, the assassination researchers who want to get their hands on the film and see it and use it versus our family, which want, uh, wanted, I should say, versus our family, which wanted to keep it private out of a sense of obligation to the Kennedy family. Those are intrinsic conflicts. And this is a book about those conflicts, and one of the most amazing things about it that I learned over these years is that people didn't agree, but no one was really wrong. You know, it wasn't as if there was a villain somewhere in the picture. There were genuine, conflicting feelings about what should be done with this, and there was no roadmap for figuring out what to do with it. So with that, I'm just going to read a few pages from uh, the epilogue to my book, about the, both about the, my own, the private legacy of the film, my own attempt to kind of um, come to terms with the silence in our family and what this book represents, and then its public legacy. As I came close to finishing this book, I found myself revisiting some of my early questions about the place of the film in my personal life. Why didn't we ever talk about the film when I was growing up? Was there something that I needed to understand in order to make sense of the film's place in our family life? Was there a personal legacy of the Zapruder film? And if so, what was it? My grandfather had once described the assassination as a wound, one that leaves residual pain even after it heals. 
It wasn't until I wrote this book that I saw how well his words reflected the experience of the rest of the family who were alive at the time and how perfectly they summed up our family's relationship to the film. For my grandparents, my aunt and uncle, and for my parents, this wound was composed of many parts. The crushing of the Kennedy dream, the association with the grotesque visual record of his murder, the moral dilemma that the film raised, the unease that came with financial gain, and the public criticism that followed. At its core, however, was the unavoidable reminder of that other family, the Kennedys, whose shattering tragedy our fam family's home movie records. What I did not fully grasp until writing this book was that the ongoing life and intrusions of the film made it a living wound inside our family. Over time, most of the American public moved on, deciding when and even if they wanted to revisit the JFK assassination. This was not so for my grandfather, first of all, and then for my father, who hardly experienced a week over the course of 25 years, during which he did not have to deal with something related to the film. Seen from this vantage point, I can understand why the Zapruder film didn't come up at our family dinner table. But more to the point, I can see why there was no family story that we inherited, the way we absorbed the memories of our grandfather. For our parents' generation, permanently, irrevocably tethered to the JFK assassination by virtue of the Zapruder film, there was never enough time or distance to see the story and its implications clearly enough to even fully realize that there was a legacy to pass along, long, let alone to shape and tell it. As in all families, time passes, new generations appear, and we take what we have inherited and form our own stories, even when what we have inherited is ambivalence, confusion, or silence. As much as I feel the pathos of that time, Kennedy's death was not my personal loss, and the Zapruder film was not my wound. I wrote this book for myself and for the historical record to document the film's history as fully, honestly, and forthrightly as I could. But I also wrote it for our family, especially for the next generation of Zapruders, to whom I wanted to bequeath something more than silence, questions, and doubts about this part of our history. For me, the messy, complicated, tangled story of the Zapruder film is our family's legacy. Now all that remains is for us to claim it. If that is the last word for the moment on the private dimension of the Zapruder film, there is still a bigger and more important question. What is its public legacy? What is the compelling lore that makes the assassination researchers, the film art and cultural historians, the writers and journalists, the academics and students and hobbyists and Kennedy buffs return to it as a touchstone time and again? I have come to think that it is because the Zapruder film is, in every way, a conundrum. It contains its own irreconcilable contradictions. It is visual evidence that refuses to solve the mystery of who murdered the president, why, and how. It is a single strip of film in which we all see different things. It shows the entire course of history changing under the influence of a single bullet. It is quite possibly the most important historical film ever made, and it is an amateur home movie. It is six feet of eight millimeter film on a plastic reel that turned out to be worth $16 million. It is the most private and the most public of records. It is gruesome and terrible, but we cannot stop looking at it. But more than that, the deepest, most compelling conundrum of the film is an existential one. It lies in the arc of the film itself, the fall from grace, the unforgiving inevitability of it. It is a sunny day, a handsome husband and his beautiful wife are riding down the street, smiling and waving with their lives stretched out before them. And within less than half a minute, his head explodes and he is dead. And she is covered in his brains and blood, trying to recover his skull from the trunk of the limousine. He is alive and then he is dead. She is a wife and then she is a widow. She is grace itself and then she is sprawled across the back of the car. How can it be that our protections and illusions can be stripped from us so quickly? Most of us are able to live our days exactly because we are not confronted with this vulnerability, the inexplicable capriciousness of fate, the permanence of death. And yet, there is the Zapruder film. It exists and we cannot turn away even though we fear it and we avert our eyes 
and we wish desperately that it would end differently every time. Maybe it is the same impulse that causes us to watch the Challenger explode in the bright blue Florida sky, or the Twin Towers crash down into lower Manhattan on a crisp fall morning. It is because we resist the knowledge that hope sometimes turns to despair in an instant, that tragedy comes out of nowhere on a beautiful day, and paradoxically, because sometimes we need to confront that very truth, simply to see the thing that we feel cannot happen in order to touch for a moment the very limits of what we know about life and to remind ourselves of the fragility of it all. Thank you. Here. Success. <laughs> Success. Yeah. Can we be heard? I think we're. Yep, you're right. Mm. I'm present. <laughs> <laughs> it's, of course, a pleasure to be seated between two writers I admire so deeply and whose work has been both inspiring to me and also genuinely provocative. And um, I, I want to just join the Zapruder chorus and say that when I first heard about this event, it also puzzled me. Um, I, I have to, I'm still um, hesitant to articulate the phrase artifactual consciousness, but there I've said it, and I've, it's, a, it's alive. Matthew actually said epistemology, so that's also on the table. <laughs> We're just going to have to deal with it. But um, <laughs> then I did what I do when I don't understand things. I just, I often just put. Um, the objects in front of me and see what happens when they're next to each other. And so I really went back and reread both um, Alexandra's beautiful elegiac book and Matthew's astonishing and original book. And some really remarkable similarities just rose up that I hadn't heard when I read them independently. So I wanted to just begin there. Um, both books begin with a kind of confessional moment about discovering the object. Um, in Alexandra's case, she goes to William Manchester's book, A Death of the President, when she's, I think, 11 years old, yeah. is that right? And um, looks up to see if her name appears in the book. And that's the sort of private, almost secretive beginning of the willingness to attach to that artifact. Mm -hmm. And Matthew recounts a story which is um, being assigned to, you have to deal with a poem in grammar school and taking the first name off the list, which is Auden, that would be easy for anyone to begin with. <laughs> um, and in both cases, their attachment in Matthew's to poetry and Alexander's to the idea of the film or the name that's attached to the film, the grandfather who, whom she doesn't know, um, remain rather secret and in some ways become more secretive over time and resistant to knowing that thing mm. to the point where Alexandra has a career as a researcher and a historian and Matthew has a career as a poet and a teacher and they're both resisting the increasingly loud chorus of questions about why poetry? I don't understand poetry, why don't you explain it to me? Why doesn't it rhyme? <laughs> and, you know, well, did, your, did you take the film? Do you have the film? Can we see the film? Could we do, have a party and discuss the film? <laughs> so I'm interested in this resistance to what people wanted to know and your, how you made the pivot to finally take the authority or the willingness to become the person who would be responsible for that artifact, mm. who would answer those questions. That is a great question. Would you like to answer well, first, Matthew? I, I, wait a minute, I went first the first time. No, you go first this time. <laughs> I, was, yeah, I already went um, first one. <sighs> Such a good question. Um, in my case, as Michael knows, Michael is a dear, dear friend, and I don't write anything without Michael Downing, so he knows this book um, intimately. But um, 
there was a resistance to it, and as Michael once said to me, there was a sort of anti-magnetism about the film, at least in our family. It was repellent in some way. Um, it, we were the only people for whom it was repellent. Everyone else in the world seemed to be very interested in it, but in our family, it was the opposite. And um, I think for me, there were several things. One thing, of course, is that by the time I wrote this book, I had already written a book, which was about the Holocaust, a collection of diaries written by teenagers. And I had already staked my claim, in a way, on writing about the historical past mm -hmm. and, and grappling with fragments of that past and trying to assemble them in um, coherent narratives. And so for me, it wasn't, once I realized what an unbelievably fascinating, incredible story this was, that was the news flash. But once I realized that, it, was, it wasn't hard to think about. That, I mean, I knew I wanted to write about it. However, what I didn't really say before is that there was resistance outside of me and inside the family, not from Matthew or from my twin brother Michael, who are both artists and who encouraged me to do this from the absolute beginning, but from other unnamed quarters um, within the family who, for whom this was going 100% flying in the face of everything that you know, represented the prevailing family culture around the film. Discretion, you know, not calling attention to it, not airing our dirty laundry. And so that was extremely difficult. And it was difficult in the writing because my first attempts to try to write this, I sort of said to myself, you know, like, I'm going to write this book, but I'm not going to talk about the money, you know? Or I'm going to write this book, but there's not anything about me. I'm just going to, I'm going to be a historian. Or, you know, I'm going to write a book, but I'm not going to talk about our family. You know, and I was trying to find a way to avoid the thing that both held the key and also that was the most fraught and the most complicated. And ultimately, um, you know, thanks to Michael and other good friends, it became clear that I couldn't do it that way. And so um, when I decided that it had to be done. And then it was a matter of just going in, right, as you know. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. did it change your sense of yourself as a researcher, as a historian, as a writer, to have done that publicly? Um, I think I felt a risk in that because, because I, I want so much to write real serious history that is also engaging and interesting and narrative and that grabs you. And I was worried about the part of it that was about myself or about our family was going to bleed into this fuzzy memoir territory that was going to sort of delegitimize what I wanted to do. And it was, again, Michael, who, um, you know, who really encouraged me to, to figure out a voice that was, was really me, like really the way that I was doing the work. And once that happened, once I found that, um, I think a lot of those fears went away. I don't know if it changed me. I mean, I think doing this book was, you once said, you know, it's sort of in the way. <laughs> you know, this is like this giant elephant in the room. And so I think from that point of view and from the point of view of, you know, mastering an enormous amount of research and marshalling, marshalling it into a story, I feel a sense of confidence from that. Um, but, but in terms of its topic, you know, it certainly didn't make me want to write anything more about the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> this is a one-off, for sure. I love that phrase in the way because I, I think Annie Dillard first gave it to me of things getting in your way and letting mm. things get in your way. And I, mm. th that's exactly the spirit of the, my question about mm. you, the questions you were hearing. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd like to say Michael did not help me at all with my book. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a talk about a wound. Um, but uh, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to say about why I wrote this book. Um, I try to address a lot of it in the introduction, but. Um, oh, there's a lot to say about the resistance to that, too. I mean, there's a kind of thing among poets where they don't, they don't like to talk about their work or they think that somehow it's trying to re-explain the poem is, d diminishes it, which on a certain level really makes sense because often you'll read your poem and then somebody will say, well, tell me what that really means. And you're supposed to re-say it in prose as if you had a secret message, which is the entire point of the book to dispel that. Idea. So, so in a way, the whole book is a contradiction because it was at, at risk of doing the very thing that I was complaining about with poetry. 
Um, so it began out of that paradox. But, um, you know, by my, I was attracted to the impossibility of that idea. Um, I also like, when I hear a rule, I like to break it. And if the rule is don't talk about poetry, I immediately am drawn to try to explain it in the simplest <laughs> language possible and see if that can be done. Um, and I also think, you know, just on a basic level, I was, I was, I write about this in the introduction, but I was, I had published two books of poetry and I was giving a lot of readings and talks and traveling all over and people were asking the same sorts of questions. Um, not of my poetry in particular necessarily, but just, I was doing a lot of traveling and I would meet people or talk to people and, or just people in my family or friends of, you know, and, and they would ask me some version of, 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 of what is this all about, poetry? What, why do you do it? What's the point of it? What does it mean? And I just thought, well, why don't I just try to answer those questions? Mm -hmm. why, why, why am I holding myself apart from it or above it or something? Why don't I engage with them? However, you know, clumsily or haltingly those questions were asked, they're genuine questions and they're legitimate questions and I, and I had the instinct that in answering them, it would generate something uh, important to me as a poet and maybe important to readers. So that was, I think that's where it came from. But yeah, there was a lot of internal resistance or just sort of basic, it was also just a difficult project, I think, to do. So, so um, yeah, I really um, missed writing poetry when I wrote this book. And I was so relieved <laughs> to write poetry again after I was done with it. So it, it, it enacted the very thing I was saying, which is that there's a difference between writing poetry and prose. And I, right. I experienced that viscerally when I finished <laughs> it and began writing poetry again. I believe you said at one point, I don't know how you people do this. I know. <laughs> it's a sure nightmare. That's an exact Yeah, quote. writing prose is a nightmare. I was like, it's so fun. What are you it's talking about? It's such a grind. Like, I love God, it. You have to sit down and work and work and work. You can't get up and have a snack. And, you, you totally know, can get up and have a that's snack. That's true. But, you can definitely get up and have a snack. But it can happen. <laughs> You know, it's funny you, the way you're talking about it, and I'm also thinking then about um, the, the arc of both books. Um, again, which was an illumination to me when I put them next to each other. Um, both books move toward, in fact, Alex, you read a, a piece which has stayed with me about uh, essentially negation, the idea of negation of um, you actually give us negative capability in the book and sort of take it apart in your own life and also in terms of your own writing and your living there. But it's, a, it's an, almost a truism um, of thinking about thinking or thinking about things that what we're trying to do is establish what they are not in the end, right? That we're exfoliating meaning in order to, and association in order to get to something original, to get to a new view of it. And in both your books, that word negation, neg negativity, what a thing is not, mm -hmm. a denial of what it is, a refusal of what it is, is in fact, in some ways, the culmination. Mm -hmm. it's, um, and I wonder if you feel like it's actually possible to get to an original moment with a poem, or to get to that moment where, by negation, you achieve something, as a reader, as a thinker. Mm -hmm. You mean when talking about poetry? Yeah. Yes. I do. I do. I think you can say things. I think that the purpose ultimately of saying things is to bring you back to the poem um, or to bring you somewhere else and leave the poem behind. But I don't think that trying to replace the poem with something is, is um, productive. And I think that the, one of the problems with the way we're taught poetry is that is precisely what we're asked to do, is to replace the poem with something else, um, as if it's a you know, dangerous object that needs to be diffused with prose or something, and, and maybe it is. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that, yeah, many, many, many amazing things can be said leading you up to poems and then beyond them. I mean, I, I think a lot about um, a basic reading method with when I'm teaching poetry, and first, first thing is read what's on the page take the words as, they, as what they say and what they mean and just get situated with what's actually going on. Then look for what's strange. What is, in, what is not right? What is, what is being done that's you know, not, not the way it's supposed to be? Whether that's something formal or something in the subject matter or something impossible where a limit's reached. And then forget about the poem and, and move on and allow yourself to think 
uh, beyond the poem? What does it make you think of? What things in your own life? What, and don't feel that you need to fold those things back into the interpretation of the poem, because the whole purpose of a work of art is to send you off into your own directions. And so I think that on the either end of that, or on all, on all three stages of that, many, many things can be said about poems that are amazing, but they just, with respect to the, to the fact of the object, the artifact, if you will, that's, that's, still, that's still there, and then it, 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 it should not be replaced. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does, and I'm thinking also about what Alex said about the stability of the film, that the film is the film and the mm -hmm. film in the end. And is the poem really the poem? You, you know, yeah. it's, we say um, each person will bring meaning to it. You say, you know, there's a way it will expand, it will, you'll, it will have associative meaning for different people. And yet you also explicate some of the poems with authority, with a sense of certainty, mm -hmm. um, as if it is a thing that a other, another person could know what you know about it, and ought to. Well, William Emson in Seven Types of Ambiguity talks about weak ambiguity and strong ambiguity. And weak ambiguity is this kind of nihilistic freshman in college, sort of like, well, if it doesn't mean anything specific, then it could mean anything. You know, which people say about art all the time, which is nonsense. Of course, that's not true. I mean, that's not anybody who knows anything about anything knows that's not true. But, 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 uh, but, uh, that's you know, strong, but, that's not strong. what? <laughs> but strong, I mean, but so the, ver the paradox of it, I think any work of art is, is that you encounter it and you take very seriously what it is, and then that that encounter itself produces multiplicities of possibility. Mm -hmm. And only through that seriousness of the encounter can you have the multiplicity of, of ideas. You know? So yes, I think that when, um, you know, to take an example, I mean, you take a Robert Frost poem and it's, um, you know, they're in the snow and they're, it's snow, it's not rain, it's not a sunny day in that poem, right? Mm -hmm. It's snow. It would be absurd to say it doesn't mean any, you know, and that's important. And often when you're teaching poetry, reading poetry, people skip over those simple things. You know, they don't even acknowledge the basic facts of the poem. And it sounds almost idiotic to say that, but it's, it's quite true. I've seen it many times. No, I think that's right. So. And I think that's exactly what you were saying also about this idea that the, the film ultimately is a commemorative film of a tragic moment. It's, mm -hmm. it's that we forget that, that we're watching the, the, our more own mortality played out in front of us and the inexplicable agency of a human being in the death of another human being. I mean, mm -hmm. That's the mystery at the film center that you articulate so well. But I wonder if thinking through the, the history of accumulation of meaning with the film has made you rethink the utility of the film, the importance of the film. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to hear Matthew talk about the poem in this way because the film you know, the film is, of course, an artifact, and it's a, it's a visual artifact. And it, what are the facts of the film? You know, what are they? And, you know, it's particularly poignant and meaningful, I think, right now, you know, when we are having this sort of large cultural conversation about facts, and I can't believe I'm about to say this, but <laughs> what they are, which I think we know what they are, um, and this distance between fact, information, knowledge, and understanding, and that there's, those things are not all the same. And so for me, I mean, I didn't know, when I started doing this work, I could not have told you one single thing about anything having to do with the various theories about what the film did or didn't show. I had to educate myself on that. And one of the things that I learned that was so fascinating is that the consensus among people who know these sorts of things is that had Oswald not been shot two days after the assassination of the president, the film would not have had the life that it did. It was because Oswald was dead that the film was suddenly elevated to this incredibly significant, um, as this incredibly significant artifact. It became, in the words of Life magazine, the so-called unimpeachable witness. 
to what had happened. That was a marketing, you know, that was like a, that was a description of the film, but that was the description of a film by Life Magazine, which had just purchased the film and was hoping to sell copies of their magazine. So, um, so, you know, this, and then it, and then it, that idea became embedded in, in our, you know, sort of understanding of what the film is. And it, it's so interesting because if you get away from the specifics, it's totally true. It, it is, it has become this collective memory. But if you have to study, who studies a memory, <laughs> you know, for answers to questions about a crime? Nobody does that, that's crazy. And yet that's sort of what we're doing with this, with this object. So it's just, so that was one of the things that certainly came about. You know, people have asked me, there are some people who, you know, I meet people all the time who say, you know, I just want to thank you for what your grandfather did and your grandfather was such an amazing person for doing this and it's so great that he did this because it captures, it's a record of the, you know, you can see the conspiracy and um, thank God he did it. And then there are people who say, you know, it really would have been better if he hadn't done it. <laughs> because, and I sort of get what they mean. You know, there is a way in which the existence of the film so totally complicated the question of, and, and our outsized faith in visual records over the ballistics and the forensics and all the other pieces of, of information that have to be put with the film, um, you know, made it more complicated. People felt that it was enough simply to see the film and that would be the answer. And that is not the case. You cannot, the answer is not in the film alone. Reminds me of that, um, I don't know, I can't remember if you told us in the book this, this family legend, which is that oh. for a while people um, would try to analyze the film based on the camera jerking and they sort of thought, they said that, you know, where the camera jerked was a sign that there were more, more shots taken. And then, uh, was it my dad? He said, I, think I think it was Uncle Myron. Was someone said, uh, well, if that's the case, then you would think people were shooting at his grandkids all the time, because they it's <laughs> <laughs> like, the camera jerks you. So, it's, yeah, so I'm not sure there's like, right. not much was, to the, uh, Right, he was not famous for having yeah, a steady, steady hand, hand in the family. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. right, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> but it's, you know, I don't want to just let go of the sort of political aspect of this or the, it, uh, comes up in your book as well in terms of the political mm. utility of poetry or the necessity of the voice and language and tr uh, true language. And that word true is problematic. It's always been problematic and I wondered as I listened to you talking about the film in particular, whether part of the reason it's problematic is we want it to be. That we want not mm -hmm. to have these facts and therefore we obscure them with our questions or mm -hmm. with our interpretations. And, I, I was thinking when I was reading Matthew's book of a beautiful short story by Joy Williams called Harmony. It's just mm -hmm. 250 words long about a young woman who visits her mother in the hospital. Her mother is dying. And her mother has a book of poems which the daughter finds and it's love poems. And she's written in the margin, untrue. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, I kept thinking about that when I was reading uh, your ideas about what a poem can do, what language can do, why it is necessary to have poems in the 21st century. Do we still need them? Um, do we still need a poetic voice? What's different about that than a political voice? So I, I was wondering, you know, the sort of necessity of that. When we say why poetry, one question for me is, yeah, why? Because um, it does something no other form of language can do that we need, whether or not we know it. And if you are, um, if you take poetry out into the world, you see that. It's empirically um, demonstrated again and again. Um, I could use an example, not that I need to, but um, after 9-11, when people gathered, uh, they didn't read stories. Forgive me, the <laughs> stories are great. They didn't read newspaper articles. They didn't sing songs on guitar or whatever. You know, that was not right. All those things were not right. They read poems, because poems are the thing. They're 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 uh, they move into the void with pure attention and dedication to human need, while also acknowledging the vast unknowability and, and silence that's around them. Mm. And uh, that's when people ask me, you know, what's the difference between poetry and songs? I say, well, songs have music to help them and help the words. 
Mm -hmm. and, and poetry takes place in silence. It's always against the background of silence um, and the blank spaces. And so I think we need that. And it's the all, you know, it's from the beginnings of the use of language, there was poetry, and there will always be poetry. And um, poetry is in no danger. Nothing will ever threaten poetry. Um, it will be continue to be written and spoken as long as they're human beings. And so I don't want to worry about poetry. Um, I just get annoyed when people say stupid things about it. So I try to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't want to just nod when you say it's always written against this background of silence. Or mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand what that means to you as a writer, as a poet. It mean, it's something, thank you for asking more about that. It means both something physical and that the actual, I feel the presence of silence and my violation in a way of it, or at least negotiation with it as I'm writing. And I think that that is enacted both in the sound of the words and also formally on the page. You can see, I mean, why do poems have line breaks? I mean, not all poems have line breaks. Sometimes they don't, but the majority of poems have line breaks. Why do they stop at the other edge of the page? One reason I do think, not the only reason, but one reason is to acknowledge that limit over and over again. It's exciting, it's thrilling, and dangerous. But also in their content, um, they, they, they are so often around, centered around negation, what can't be known, what can't be understood, the limits of, of, and they're purely, a lot of times they're purely interested in those ideas. I mean, prose can often talk about those things or touch on them, or, but poems, are just seem, the more poetry I've read and the more I've, it seems entranced by the idea of um, this. I have a quote by Fanny Howe in my book, which, is, which, which describes this exact thing, which I'm going to read because she is here. Oh. And <laughs> I'm gonna do that because oh. it will say it better than my saying myself. So if you don't mind, I will just find it. It is in the final chapter of the book, which is called Nothing is the Force That Renovates the World, um, which is a quote from Emily Dickinson. Um, and I'll just read this tiny little paragraph in it first. So once in a lecture, I heard the poet Ralph Angel, which is a great name for a poet, right? Ralph Angel, <laughs> negative capability, um, say poetry has always existed and always will exist because there will always be the need to say that which cannot be said. The lyric, writes Fanny Howe in her essay, Bewilderment, is a method of searching for something that cannot be found. Poetry by nature brings us up to the limit of what we can know, and in great part, this is why it exists and continues to be written. So thank you, Fanny Hump. <laughs> it's that problem of the limit of what I was thinking in both cases, yeah. the limit of what we can know and what we can't know. And one thing I don't want to limit is the other curiosities and questions that might emerge from our audience already a volunteer. <laughs> if you've written a poem about the film yet. No. no. Not to my knowledge. <laughs> no, no. no. There's too much there. I don't think it'd be so hard to operate for me in that space. It's just, it's too full of significance. No, I just never have. I never even thought about it, actually, until you asked that question. <laughs> Can I ask a second question? I'm just wondering, the way you both were talking about this film is something that you've put aside if Alexandra writing this book it was a way for you to sort of own the film? Um, I don't think I set out to do that. Um, but I think a lot like um, some of the things that Matthew was saying, it is, it, it was, and this is what I like to do in, in the work and all of the writing that I, and historical inquiry that I'm interested in, it was a way of diffusing and attacking it and going into the dark places and trying to be, find that fearlessness to say like, what can be said? What, what, what are we so afraid of? Why are we so weird about this thing? And, and I think that the book does get to that. You know, there was, some of it was that there was deep pain for my grandfather and our father. Um, and some of it was that 
there was moral ambiguity and it was incredibly complicated. And one of the things that happened for me in the writing of this book was that I had this amazing moment, actually this great moment. Um, I went to meet with, I had interviewed a lot of people for this book and I interviewed a lot of people who were on the other side of our family in various um, situations, who had been critical of our family or who were whatever, who were on the other side of the table. And I had this moment, I called my mother after one of these interviews, and I said to her, you know, I think I thought there was like a secret dad who was like maybe mean or bad. Like there was some secret guy who was our dad who we, I didn't know. And there's no secret dad. Dad was dad. Every person I met, wherever they were in relation to our family, said the same things about him. And so for me, some of it was that the silence fed the fear, but that when I really pulled back all those layers and tried to really look at it, there wasn't anything there that was too hard to see. And that was very um, liberating. It was not only, not, I don't experience it as like a huge weight or anything like that, but what I do feel very strongly about is that there are five grandchildren. There are five, you know, I have two, Matthew has one, our other brother has two, and they all have our name. And they will go through life with that name. And it is a huge relief to feel that there is a narrative and a story and that these questions have been asked um, in order to, you know, to be able to pass that on to them. And then they'll probably reject it and, you know, write their own story, which is fine. That's what they're supposed to do. But, but you know, at least they will, they will have something to consider about it. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask a question here, even though I know a little insight about this family here, but um, um, I'm, I'm your cousin. <laughs> I will be here with you. Um, but I want to actually ask a question of, of, you know, Alex, you talk about the relationship between public and private. Um, and Matthew, I want to actually play off of that a little bit, of the difference between reading a poem just privately, you know, on your phone, in your book, versus having it recited out loud, and the difference of the experience of feeling something privately versus something uh, publicly, and particularly when it comes to, to poetry as well. You mean as a re like how I imagine it feels as a reader to experience that, or like? As a reader or as, a reader or as somebody who recites it, um, to be able to, and I'm thinking also from, you know, in, in prayers and, and songs, and when people read poetry together, if, when mm -hmm. that happens, and the different ways that poetry can be experienced mm -hmm. privately yeah. and publicly. Yeah, well, there's, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that, and, and um, you know, one thing, one thing I think and wish I would say more often is that, you know, when you read a poem, sometimes it's not, people, people can get really worried about making sure they get everything in it and understand it all or whatever, but we have this amazing technology of, of the book and the written word that's designed so that people can go back privately and re-experience this thing. And so the, the public experience of the poem is, is one, one pass through it. It's one touch to it. And if you're attracted to something about the person's voice or their texture of it, or, and you can't even say what it is, then, then that's a good enough reason to go back and re-experience it, you know, and, and then the book. Um, I like being alone together with people in a room when they're reading poetry, or when I'm reading to them or having it read to me. Um, I like that feeling. I like looking out and seeing the way people's faces look when I read poems to them. They look so uh, thoughtful and it's a different face than you ever see anywhere else. And it just feels more and more necessary to me. So I. I hate giving readings because they make me nervous and I, I, I am appalled by my public experience in relation to other people. Um, and I, 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 I want every single time I ever give a reading, every single fucking time, I think, why am I doing this? I hate doing this. Why didn't I stay home? I get sleepy. That's my nervous reaction, I get very sleepy. Um, and I just, 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 the whole thing is just a nightmare. But, but, I, but I also like it once I get up there, usually, because then I, in that 
feeling of communion and, you know, if it's not a terribly resistant experience, um, which it usually isn't. So, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, it's an interesting, weird thing to do to be exposed in that way in front of other people. It's a very odd event in your life, but, you know, for some reason, I guess it's maybe useful. I don't know, but I hope it is because it's a not pleasant. <laughs> I'll get you. There's somebody you're going to ask, and then we'll get Joel. Uh, Matthew, I just wanted to thank you for your work. I've been reading it for a handful of years, um, and I don't have words for it because it just does a lot for me and, and, and around me. And, and um, I, but, but something that happens both when I read it on paper and when I see on video, on YouTube, especially Tonight You'll Be Able, which I've shared with so many people, or Schwinn, that both reading your work and hearing you, there's something, maybe if I have a word for it, there's an embrace, an embrace of yourself, uh, the persona, and maybe the reader. And I wanted to thank you for that, but also, if it's thank not you. too much, ask when you feel like you've been embraced by certain poems or poets. Um, thank you for that. Um, that's what you live for as a writer, to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this book I wrote is full of poems that feel that way to me, and there's so many poets, I mean, and poetry itself has brought me to my friendships, my wife, you know, whose parents are, and uh, whose, whose father and, and stepmother are in the audience right now, and you know, it's brought me everything, poetry. So it's in a way, it's it's in, except my family, which is you know, that came before. But um, yeah, I mean, I I I I don't know. I mean, there's so so many poets, so many poems, and I just and I think I just need that that feeling you're talking about all the time. And I need it more and more now, I guess. So, But thank you for saying that. Uh, Joel has a question, like my father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I has a lot of questions, actually. <laughs> yeah. First of all. <laughs> no, no, it's not a question. It's actually an observation. You know, when you write a poem, it's, it's a word strung together. And each of those words has a meaning. But when you string them all together and read the poem, you're actually, mm. as you said, touching sort of the unknowable, mm -hmm. okay? It elicits a feeling and you think you know more than you do or you want to know more than you do <coughs> from reading that poem. Mm -hmm. But really, you get, at least for me, an impression. And it's not really knowledge, it's, it's something else. Mm -hmm. And when, with the film, it's a physical thing that mm -hmm. you see and you talked about geometry, you know, people apply geometric principles right. to that film, but still the bottom line is it's unknowable. You know, it's information of a type, mm -hmm. but at its essence, it's in a way the same as reading a poem mm -hmm. or any work of art. Mm -hmm. Looking at the Mona Lisa, it's essentially unknowable, mm -hmm. but people think that they can know it mm -hmm. when they can't. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely disturbing to a human being when you think you should know something or can know something, but you really can't. It's like living with a type of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And some people find that extremely uncomfortable. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. I mean, I think it, it makes me think about, you know, recently, um, there was this, the release of new files related to the JFK assassination, and there was a lot of, you know, media hoopla around it, and I was asked many times in various places about, you know, what it means, and did we get any closer to, to knowing the answer to what happened? And I, I just, I sometimes think, you know, something actually happened that day. There is one thing that actually happened on Dealey Plaza. But it goes to sort of what Michael said, too, and what you said, Joel, that, you know, maybe it's as if our, the open-ended nature of this question is feeding something. Like, it's true that we don't have a consensus on what happened to the film, but what would happen if we did? Like, what would that provide? This was a rupture in American life. And everything that happens, the ongoing agonizing about the film is like an enactment of that 
-hmm. open wound that can never be healed. It just, it can't be. And the question, you know, that I keep thinking about is, you know, people look at the film and they want to figure out how it happened. But the real question is, how could this happen? How could this have happened? That is the question. And there will never be an answer to that question. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if the desire, and I've had this experience too in watching the film, you start watching the film and you hope it's gonna end differently. Totally. Every time, it's yeah. crazy. And it is crazy. You, but maybe what you're saying is a little bit that people displace that desire or that, that, that lack of ability to really understand what happened onto the, the, the question of like more, you know, who shot, the who did it, it, what like, why, how did it work or whatever, which is not to say those questions aren't important, of course they are, but like in a way the, the, their, their, their fundamental source is like you said, like how could this have happened? How could this ever have happened? How could this ever and also happen? like how could anything ever yeah, happen? Yeah, how could anything ever happen? How could anything yeah. terrible ever happen? You know, and that's, and that is always, you know, that's what the film embodies or contains that dread like you said, like in, the, in that beautiful passage you read from the end, I mean, it's like, that's, I mean, it's awful to watch the film in, in many ways, but one of its special particular awfulnesses is how beautiful it is. Mm. Yeah. It's sublime. It it's, 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 and it's, it's a complete it's, story. It has it's a total horrifying. Story arc. The, the, yeah. the, 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 it's, it is a work of art, not, not, you know, and that's, that sense of like the colors and the, the way it ends, yeah, it's, it's, it's awful, but it's, it's, yeah. But there's also the one other note I just wanted to make sure to strike in that we're all nodding again with this independent sense of meaning and this unknowableness of the, the artifact is unreliable or it's not mm -hmm. quite yielding what we need. But I feel like that's maybe new in the world. I, in other words, I think artifacts, poems, films, Mm -hmm. used to be a point of gathering for yeah. people, a communal idea. We wanted to be part of the community meaning of it. We wanted to know what other people made of it so that we could feel that. And now I feel like so much of what we're talking about tonight is the distinction of the self's meaning, yeah. the, the separation of the self from the community meaning. No, I don't see him dying, you know, maybe he's not dead. <laughs> right. You know, really, it's that right. preposterous. Right, it is that preposterous. And I, I wonder if that's... It's gone too far, right. it's gone too far. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone too far, and that's when I said that thing about the nihilism of the freshman, right. you know, uh, ambiguity, like and everything means everything, that's wrong. It's not true that any, you know, a man was killed under Luke right. the Pause. that happened, you know, and if you look at a poem, I mean, I know it's not as, uh, you know, as, as important as that, but I mean, if you look at a poem, there are things in a poem that are there, and there are things that are not there, and that is the beginning of, of communion and conversation, and I think we've gone too far. I mean, we've gone too far as a culture, we've gone too far as, as readers, we've gone too far as understanders of the world. It's, and the reason we've gone too far is because it serves some people's interest to have us gone too far. That's the bottom line. That's right. why we've gone too far, because some people benefit from us having gone too far. Right. Qui bono, right? Who benefits? Right. Like the, some people. And so that I agree with, and so I like pushing back against this idea that we're all in our private little mm -hmm. you know, meaning worlds, because that's not really actually true. Um, it just isn't. Right, well, and that's, no, and it's interesting maybe because... Maybe some things it's true, but... To bring it back to the film, one of the things that is interesting about that is that, you know, it was necessary for me in the writing of this book to push back on the places where it went too far. Because what, you know, one of the things that's so amazing, the film itself is extraordinary, but it also records the murder of the President of the United States, which itself was this... Um, it was the event that changed America and led to, you know, so much in the way of a questioning of authority and suspicion and doubt and then kind of led right into the Watergate era and all of these historical things happened that, that shaped the way that people interpreted what they were seeing. But that has limits too. There are reasonable thoughts and there are reasonable you know, theories about what could have happened. And then there is the, you know, alteration theory of the film, that the film was secretly taken the day after the assassination to a CIA lab um, in Rochester, New York, and altered. And that the film that we all see is an altered film and the real film was destroyed. I mean, that's insane. That is insane. And I cannot tell you how many times I've given talks and had people raise their hands and say, 
What do you say to people? You know, I heard that the film was altered. Um, I heard that the film that we see is not the real film. You know, here are the discrepancies. And, you know, you, when you get into that territory, you know, it is, it is a very, very disconcerting terrain because, you know, you're just, it's, it's unhinged in a way and it doesn't, there's no grounding. And yet you have to debate it. You have to contend with it, which is for many of us what our daily lives are like now. <laughs> Every time we turn on the news. Maybe, maybe one more and then we'll, we'll be done. And we'll answer, we'll, we'll do short. Or we can be done right now. Thank you, no, thanks so much. Wait, oh, no, wait, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. I got excited, I got excited about this being over. I here, I can stand <laughs> like, I got very excited for a second there. It was like my life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> Dinner and drinks and everything. <clears throat> can I be heard? Um, uh, Hi, Kevin. Touched, hi. Hi. You've touched my on friend. this to some extent, but, um, and, when I've talked to you, Alex, about topics like this before, the word trauma comes in my mind, but that's kind of an aside. Um, there's a sense in which we're animals and we live through time and we flow and, uh, and we move on to the next thing and our memory is just in service of getting us to the next place. But when you put these artifacts in, they drag us back into the past. You know, the movie is always the movie, and you, and it, you can't change it, and, you, and people can obsess backward toward these objects mm -hmm. in the same way they can reach back toward a poem to comfort them or whatever. They, they move back. I just am, I don't know how to ask this question, but what is it about us that doesn't want to just flow forward Ooh. but does get snagged on the, on, the, on the past or something? We're not animals. We have, we, we remember, we, we understand that the, what happened in the past affects our future. I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'm saying, I think that's the answer. It's important what happened. And it means something. And it's not, it isn't, it isn't, you can't just let everything go and just brush it off. And I think we know that and we, and it's a hard knowledge and it's a painful knowledge and it's not clear. But I think that poets, I mean, I just know that poets like that psycho-symbolic territory of the past. Um, for that because there's so much meaning in there. Mm -hmm. And you can like dig around and pull out objects and there's this stuff it adheres. You know, and, it's, and it is dangerous work and it is sometimes, sometimes you just wish that you could just go forward or forget everything. But, but I mean, it's, I don't, I think that poets maybe have an instinct that there's just so much there. And it's also our collective, the I mean, another thing I have to say, like language is our collective past. It's all the decisions we've made about what, how to name things and how not to name things. And so every word we say, we have the wisdom of everybody who's ever used this word, this language before. So we can't speak without the past being in every single instant of our use of language. So even if we wanted to just move on and forget, we couldn't because we have our human past in, in coming out of our mouths all the time. And I think poets are just like attuned to that understanding. Like they, they're, like Emerson famously said, you know, that um, all language is fossil poetry. You know, poets invented words. But they were the first ones to make words attached to things with all those insufficiencies, and poets remember that. And then and our job is to re reanimate it, you know. So I think it's, yeah, sometimes it's not a great job. <laughs> I, would add, I would just add one, one thing to that, not to let my big brother have the last word. Never, um, never. Um, I, I agree with everything that Matthew said, of course, and I think from the point of view of someone who's not a poet, but someone who is preoccupied with the history, one of the things that I think is so important about how we live is that not only do we look back, but we tend to look back with, in an excessively simplistic way and the past gets flattened. It seems as if the way it happened was the only way it could have happened. And that the decisions that people made were made knowing what the outcome was going to be. And one of the things that I love so much about writing history is to remember, and this is a phrase from Michael actually, but that people lived in the fullness of their time. You know, that they lived 
in multi dimensions, exactly as we are living in this moment right now, where they could go one way and they could go another way. And they bring to every decision their background, their history, their families, how they're feeling, what they know, you know, their values. And so for me, writing about history is about reanimating that past in as many dimensions as possible and exactly the opposite of simplifying it, but sort of reanimating its complexity and trying to dwell in it and say like, it looked like this from here, but it looked like that from over there. And this is how people experience these dilemmas or these questions. And I think that there's tremendous meaning in that. You know, that is a form of meaning making for me, not only to illuminate the actual past, but that act of what is ultimately an act of of love and compassion for people, you know, to say they they were as real as I am, you know, and, and I want to understand what made them do the things that they did. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay then. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.